General Joseph W. Stilwell retreated from Burma with a band of ragged Yanks, British, and Chinese. He said, frankly, the Japs gave us a hell of a beating. Today, over vast, trackless, cloud-scraping jungle geography like this, we are battling our way back into Burma. Our purpose in retaking Burma is to blast open a land route to our great ally, China, now cut off by the Japs. Here in this gigantic army depot in Calcutta, India, are the supplies shipped from home 15,000 miles away. Our job? To get the fighting contents of these enormous cases over these sawtooth mountains to our troops. Supplies and equipment that must still go the last and hardest few miles. This is the beginning of the end of one of the most epic transportation battles of the war. Fought day after day by army railroaders, army truck experts, transport pilots, native workers. Faced with primitive transportation facilities in India, we use every available means of moving supplies. Use river barges for these P-40 Warhawk replacement motors. Head them for our airfields spread over the China-India-Burma battle area. Airfields from which General Claire Chenault's pilots are blasting the Japs. We take over this rail line leading out of Calcutta to our principal North Burma base at Lido, headquarters of General Stilwell's forces and starting point of the Lido Road. Here we meet strange difficulties. Along the route, we are forced to halt and switch from broad to narrow gauge tracks. Complete loads have to be shifted. Fuel must be re-poured. There are only a few pieces of modern machinery here. The bulk of the work must be done by hand. At the end of the line, we reload on American-built heavy trucks and keep rolling. And here begins what will go down in the annals of rubber wheeled transportation as probably the most dramatic and dangerous run ever made on a 24-hour-a-day basis. This is the Lido Road, still under construction, through North Burma to China. A hairpin highway with a roller coaster grade. A muddy, dusty road through teakwood forests, malaria swamps. A road infested with sniping Japs. And subject without warning to another enemy, landslides. The workers at home who made these bulldozers and trucks probably never realized they would end up above the clouds in far off Burma. But the job isn't finished yet. This is the headquarters for an airdroppers company. From here, by transport plane and parachute, in specially constructed wicker containers, supplies are delivered from the sky to Allied patrols and roving jungle armies deep in the Burmese interior, to General Merrill's Yank Marauders, to British Chindits, to the Chinese battalion spearing down from Yunnan province, all concentrating on wiping out the Japs in Burma. Food from America, packed with rice husks as shock absorbers. By proper packing, by using multiple parachutes, even the most delicate equipment can be safely landed. Radio transmitters like this have been dropped to our troops and retrieved in perfect condition. 50-gallon oil drums, machine guns, grenades, clothing, mail from home. All these are carried for air delivery in our giant flying boxcars, the C-47 Sky Trains. indicator. This is where we drop the stuff. in military history, troops are armed, fed, and equipped from the sky, are free to move without danger of being cut off from their source of supplies.
General Stilwell is supplied almost exclusively from the sky, depending on airborne support as he advances against the Japs in Burma. To the fighters on the CBI front, he is Uncle Joe. Here he is with some of those fighters. These are the men who are blasting open the land route from India into China, who are fighting the Battle of the Hills with the Japs in North Burma. Chinese troops fighting side by side with American doughboys. For a year before General Stilwell started climbing back over the 6,000 foot barrier separating India from Burma, thousands of Chinese soldiers like these were undergoing training at a secret American jungle training center in India. The identical training the Yank doughboys themselves were getting. Today, well trained, well fed, well led, tough and hard, armed and equipped with weapons from our own production lines, this is a remarkable army. A mixed army of hard-hitting Yanks and equally hard-hitting Chinese. Both sworn to clear the world of the brutal Japs. A job the Chinese soldiers have been trying to do since 1937 and dying in doing it. We're headed for action now, headed south toward Mandalay where the Japs are sitting astride the Burma Road and fanning out in strong counterattacks toward India. Our forces prepare to cross a jungle stream, load equipment on bamboo rafts, float them across. Four-legged, long-eared, hay-burning jeeps, the only kind that can be used here. Sometimes we're able to build a bridge with native materials as we push deeper into the interior after the Japs. Chinese Joe and G.I. Joe, both headed in the same direction. We hack our way through impenetrable forests. In Burma, the fighting differs from jungle fighting on the coral islands of the Pacific. Here, both we and the Japs try infiltration, cut-arounds, weave bags, roadblocks, all the maneuvers in the book, and a few that we make up as we go along. We run into snipers. Bring up and emplace our guns. These are typical scenes of the combat action taking place in all sectors of the vast China, Burma, India front. of the hills, battles of the brush, battles of the roads and trails and passes, battles of the streams. two are these scenes. Those of our Chinese wounded who can walk under their own power. The more serious casualties are treated in the field before being carried in crude litters to frontline emergency hospitals.
medical unit set up in the North Burma jungle, only seven miles behind the front line. A hospital with a canvas roof and no electricity. This man operating is Colonel Gordon Seagrave, the distinguished American surgeon who lived and worked in Burma for many years before the war. On his staff here are Burmese nurses he trained. After receiving emergency treatment, the wounded are prepared for removal to a base hospital at Lido. By foot, this is a trip that would take 15 days. Airborne in these small ambulance planes, the wounded can make it in an hour. And here as the tiny ambulance planes return to civilization with their wounded, in another part of the Burmese sky, a giant supply transport crosses back over these great hills with more weapons, more equipment, more ammunition, that the fight against the Jap invaders in this wilderness below may go on. Vast, trackless, tropical jungle, Burma, an enormous Jap-held barrier cutting the Burma road, starving off China from land-delivered American and English supplies where Yanks and British and Yank-trained Chinese are carving a new supply route over Razorback Mountains, through malaria swamps, through an army of desperate Japs who know that from American-maintained airfields in China, we will hit the Japanese mainland itself as we and the RAF have burned and blasted industrial targets in Hitler's Europe. Pinpoint precision delivery. These precious bundles must hit these tiny patches cleared in the jungle or be lost. We are on our way. Quebec, they created a new Southeast Asia command to strike at Burma and Indochina. They gave it to the English commando chief, Admiral Lord Mountbatten, the man on the left. Front one was the New Guinea and the Solomons. Front two was Burma. But inside China, from the old mountains and rice fields, there was a third front. All over unconquered China, a lot of times within gunshot of the Japs. The John Smiths and the Bill Browns of China's veteran and dogged army were building airfields with whatever they could find. They crushed the rock and mixed the thick gray Chinese clay with crude handmade tools. There were no trucks, so they used shoulders and bare feet. By crude ancient Chinese methods, they were constructing the way stations in a network of air transport through which one day soon would come the 50s and the 37s and the gas and the jeeps to wage modern war against the Japs. They were building for the future. Directing operations from these fields is the famed leader of the Flying Tigers, General Claire Chenault, who knows about Japs. I've heard a lot about the Jap fighting men. They're no pushovers, that's a cinch. They're tough and they're professional. Most of them from the age of 12 or 13 have been trained to fight and to kill. We're just beginning to hit our stride. Now we're carrying the war to them. We'll kick them out of the territory they've grabbed. We'll bomb their towns to toothpicks. We'll sink their ships and knock their planes out of the air until zero is just another word for nothing. We have an answer to make to the Japs, not only because they attacked us, but for special things. Pearl Harbor, Bataan, Corregidor, Hong Kong, Java, for the murder of the American pilots who were captured after Tokyo raid. And we're going to ask the Japs so they won't be asking for it again.
Our remaining two air forces have operated on the other side of the world, in India and China. Japan's unwarranted campaign of aggression began 13 years ago. A powerful Jap Air Force had undisputed control of the Chinese sky. These were happy days for the Jap flyers. They flew their missions almost unopposed. They murdered at will. In 1941, while America was still at peace, some visitors arrived in China. These were the Flying Tigers, under the command of a master tactician, Clarell Chenault. Unaware of their presence, a Jap bombing mission headed for its target. The Chinese warning system flashed the news across the hills to the Tigers. came on unsuspecting. day was six to nothing. From then on, the Flying Tigers' combat record never dropped below five to one. The Flying Tigers were supplied over the old Burma Road. Following Pearl Harbor, Japan took Burma and cut this supply line. The Tigers became members of General Chenault's 14th Army Air Force. But because of this same problem of supply, the 14th is still numerically small. Supplies for the 14th start the journey from the United States by ship. After a voyage that takes two months, the vital cargo is unloaded at Calcutta. The bulk of it must be pushed to the river dock, laboriously loaded onto barges, and shipped up river to Assam. Length of the trip, 40 days. The other route to Assam is by rail on a primitive railroad. Shortly after the trip begins, the rail becomes narrow gauge. The agonizingly slow process of unloading and reloading starts again. Frequent accidents and irregular schedules further slow up supplies. At the end of the arduous rail trip, most of the heavy equipment is loaded on trucks for a four-day journey on rough, dusty roads. And so by ship, train, river barge, and truck, the supplies for the 14th were painfully assembled in Assam, headquarters of our 10th Air Force. The 10th is one of our oldest air forces, created in haste when the Japs threatened India. Today it defends the western terminus of the only route left into China, the hop from Assam across the mountains to Kunming. The last leg of the trip is known to the pilots, going over the hump. The trip is as dangerous as any combat mission. Most of the time, the weather is so bad that the pilots have to make the 17,000-foot mountain passes on instruments. If they veer south, they drift into Jap Hill, Burma. North, into 22,000-foot peaks. The crews of the Liberators must ferry in their own bombs, gasoline, and everything else. 
In order to fly one bombing mission, they must make four trips across the hub. journey isn't over yet. There's one more leg into enemy territory. Hong Kong is the objective on this mission. The bombs are finally away. They've come 10,000 long miles. They've been en route for close to six months. But on this last couple of miles, they travel swift and true into the enemy target. Broaden the scope of our operations in China, we're building a supply route from Lado. The road is being built as we fight and will eventually connect with the old Burma road. When completed, it will carry some 40,000 tons per month. The conquest of Burma would further facilitate transport by opening up the port of Rangoon. But basically, we must have a direct route into China. For China, Besides having obvious geographical advantages, has the great asset of its people. American trained Chinese pilots have already proved themselves in the 14th. The Chinese make expert mechanics, and their manpower is limitless. Potentially, China is our best base for strategic bombing of Japan. struck at the enemy's defenses from every side. We've had some success, but Japan is still far away. Little Fort Benning, or the 60th Army School at Daytun, China, where officers of the Chinese Expeditionary Forces are given standard U.S. Army infantry training. This infiltration course compares with the best courses now being utilized in the United States. A tear gas attack. Bazooka practice. After graduation, officers return to their own units to apply newly learned training methods. Michinaw Airfield, two miles from Michinaw, as General Stilwell's forces take advantage of a lull in the monsoon rains to resume their month-long drive against the city. Aerial view of bomb-shattered Michinaw. 
Allied planes dropped about 500 tons of bombs in a single week. Despite the monsoon, the captured airfield continues to service Allied air and ground forces. Landings are difficult because filled-in shell holes are made soft by the constant rains. Supplies moved to the front by mule train. The assault on Michinaw was made possible by the 25-day mountain march of General Merrill's marauders, who cut south through Japanese lines to capture the airfield. Other columns, such as this, emerged north and west of the city to encircle the enemy. At this point, 12 animals were lost by slipping into an abyss. The battalion reaches the top of a 6,000-foot peak. C-47s drop supplies to the marauders and camped at Kachin village. through the jungle toward Michinaw. Entrenched 30 yards from the Japs, an attack is launched with BAR and rifle grenades. fire pushes the enemy into the city of Michinaw, preparing the dead for burial, evacuating the wounded. Parachutes help make this field hospital. Battle-weary and wounded marauders of B Battalion are evacuated by hospital plane to Lido for treatment and rest. Arriving at the Lido airstrip. Ambulances transport them to the 20th General Hospital located between Lido and Margarita, Assam. Arriving at the hospital. Treating the wounded.
tired marauders take a much needed rest. rains inundate the Thadazoop boathead on the Mogong River, causing damage to beach installations and supply depots. During the night of 28th June, a heavy rainfall caused the river to rise eight feet. By dawn, the boathead was completely underwater. A few of the outboard motors used for boat service to Kameng escaped submersion. shed, originally a hundred feet from the water's edge, is now several hundred feet from land. A submerged motor pool. Two miles south of Thadazook, 25th June, rains washed away the Chinese-built bridge crossing the Kwanklong River, isolating the Warazup airstrip linked to Lido. A temporary ferry service, however, meets the problem of transporting men and supplies bound for Kameng and other combat areas. British troops help Americans ferry wounded from Kameng to Thadazook. Mountbatten, Supreme Allied Commander, Southeast Asia Theater, arrives at the Warzup Airfield to confer with General Stilwell. The harbor at Kurachi, India, where Allied ships unload cargo for the China-Burma-India Theater of Operations. Excellent dock facilities have made this harbor city one of the most important military supply bases in the Near East. personnel and Indian workers unload a ship's cargo in 24 hours. Unloading P-47s and P-51s with an American gasoline-operated crane. The crane, with a lifting capacity of 25 to 30 tons, is the only one of its kind in India. The hull of the ship originally built to carry tanks, was converted to handle planes and other cargo. This trip brought 47 planes. The planes are towed through the city to the Karachi Air Base. Natives use primitive methods to supply lumber for allied installations. Engineers have brought in modern methods and equipment using a gas driven chainsaw.
Caterpillar tractor now tows the logs to the depot for transportation to the sawmill. and 16 foot lengths. The original length of logs may run up to 120 feet. Trucks are loaded by a turner lift crane. Logs are then taken down the Lido Road to the sawmill at engineer supply section. A Cornish portable sawmill cuts logs into planks. This mill can be assembled or taken down in two days. These scenes show some of the military projects built with Burmese lumber. pontoon bridge. The 420-foot bridge is being built by the engineers on 40-foot pontoons made from native lumber. At Lekapani, a railhead of the Bengal Assam line near Lido, equipage for a 25-ton ponton bridge model 1940 is transferred from flat car to trailer by the 446th Engineer Battalion. 75th Engineer Light Ponton Company will transport the ponton equipage to Michinaw, where a heavy-duty span across the Irrawaddy River is needed. From the end trucking point, the convoy heads down the Lido Road. Near Tingok Sakan, a march unit of semi-trailers negotiates a mile-long causeway built after the last monsoon. With an overall length of 53 feet, the semi-trailers encounter difficulties on the hairpin curves of the Lido Road in the mountains between Warazup and Kamang. Transportation is delayed two weeks as the curves are widened. Despite this, some of the trailers shave the embankments, damaging a few pontons. At Mogong, the railroad operation battalion in charge of the 30-mile stretch of track connecting with Michinaw shifts the bridging equipment to flat cars. Also, newly trained Chinese troops moving up to the Salween front ride the same train. As the Ponton equipage arrives at Michinaw early in December, the 75th Engineer Light Ponton Company handles final phases of transportation to the bridge site on the banks of the Irrawaddy. Construction by parts is the method chosen for the Irrawaddy span. While the bridge is begun by the formal method of construction with successive pontons, four boat three bay parts are assembled at other points on the near shore and maneuvered into position. Routes of communication in the rugged terrain of North Burma continue of strategic importance in the drive to route the Japs above Mandalay. While advance elements such as the U.S. infantry and artillery troops known as the Mars Task Force are frequently supplied by parachute, Heavy equipment must go overland via truck and mule pack. This heavy-duty ponton bridge near Michinaw is the first major span over the Irrawaddy, regarded as a highway through the center of Burma. Chess is laid as flooring. In the background, a bridge approach is cleared by angle dozers. The completed ponton bridge. Although its normal capacity is 25 tons, it may be reinforced to accommodate tank loads up to 35 or 40 tons. Chinese infantrymen cross en route to the front. South of Michinaw on 7th December, the Mohawk River is forded by elements of the first provisional American and Chinese tank group. They're proceeding down the unfinished Lido Road to assist in the reduction of the besieged Jap stronghold at Bamo. Arriving there on 16th December, the tank group is one day too late to take part in the finish. War dogs behind Jap lines on 4th December. 
As part of the Mars Task Force, commanded by Brigadier General John P. Willey, the 2nd Battalion, 475th Regiment, drives southwest from Barmo. Four members of the India-Burma War Dogs Detachment scout jungle trails. German shepherds and infantrymen work together at all times. At a bivouac area, food for each dog is prepared by his handler. Meanwhile, the 1st Battalion of the 475th bypasses encircled Bamo to strike southwest toward Shwegu. It's another unit of the task force constituted of marauder veterans plus replacements and IB volunteers. From Michinaw, the battalion has marched more than 200 miles in 14 days. An incident of the trail. Mule skinners extricate their charge from a stream near Shwegu. Woven bamboo mats are used to repair the bridge. The Mars Task Force element by mid-December is closer to Mandalay than any other Allied troops in Burma. On 10th December, wounded infantrymen of the 475th 2nd Battalion are evacuated to Manhorn, still deeper in enemy territory after contacting the Japs at Mo Liang. While the wounded receive attention, the 612th Field Artillery Battalion presses forward to shell Tonkwa, 120 miles north of Mandalay. Meanwhile, at Michinaw on 4th December, an extensive air evacuation has begun. Chinese troops trained in India and toughened in battle in Burma are to be transported back to their homeland for countermeasures against the Jap drive aimed at cutting China in two. American officers remain with their Chinese troops. Sacks of rice as well as personal baggage go with the military equipment evacuated with the 114th Chinese Infantry Regiment. and 11th December, the 47th Regiment, 14th Division, 54th Chinese Army with full equipment, including horses and mules, is evacuated from the North Strip at Michinaw. Destination is Chanyi, China, 70 miles northwest of Gunming, threatened headquarters of the U.S. 14th Air Force. The 317th and 319th Troop Carrier Groups have the task of flying the Chinese Regiment and its equipment over the hump. It's the first time pack animals will be flown over these peaks of the Himalayas. Bamboo stalls inside the converted C-47s. The hump is crossed at an altitude of between 12 and 15,000 feet. pack animals are landed safely at Chanyi. Despite clumsy unloading, these Indian Tonga ponies apparently suffer no ill effects from their air journey. Chinese civilian evacuees and soldiers jam-packed the only road leading west from Liuzhou. Resting for a brief interval, these Chinese flee advancing Japanese driving northwestward along the Guangxi Guizhou Railroad in south central China. Like Guilin and other 14th Air Force bases running south from Hubei province, Liuzhou was only a short stopover place for many Chinese. They began their wanderings with the initial phase of the Japanese offensive in the north late in May 1944. The long trek continues. At this point, advance units of an estimated 250,000 Japanese troops are but a few miles behind. Their apparent objective, Guizhou province and the provisional capital of Chongqing. Chinese armored units retreat to more favorable positions. With them go American vehicles, some of which bear U.S. liaison units, road demolition crews, and transportation units removing the last supplies from danger areas. 
north becomes a one-way stream of mass evacuation, increasing in volume as weary refugees leave one village after another deserted and destroyed. Meanwhile, Allied forces endeavor to keep China's lifeline open, despite the threat at Guiyang. C-47s reach Dongyue airstrip, bringing vital equipment to speed completion of the Lido-Burma road, construction going westward from China into Burma. This equipment comes directly from India, two months after the capture of Dongyue. Dongyue airstrip was enlarged especially to accommodate C-47s. Most of the equipment came in parts. Assembled, they will provide air compressors for drills, D-7 bulldozers and other machines. Dongyue lies somewhat west of the old Burma Road in Yunnan province. A spur has been built from the road west to the airstrip. This spur can now be continued into Burma. China. For 10 years, the Japs have spread across our land. For two or three years, we've aided China with the planes and bases of the 14th Air Force. Today, due to the present Japanese offensive from the south and north, this aid is now being canceled. The largest and most recent of our bases to be abandoned is Guilin. Guilin capital of Guangxi province and center of South China's defenses. As Japanese forces from the north and south near the city threatening to split China in two, the inhabitants of Guilin leave their homes in a mass evacuation. This latest Chinese debacle not only uproots thousands of men, women, and children, many of whom experienced previous evacuations, but in the words of Brigadier General Clinton D. Vincent, is the worst strategic defeat ever suffered by an American force. Hands aid in the evacuation. Scores of evacuees, their households reduced to mere bundles, take the river route to Liuzhou, 80 miles away. At Guilin's North Station, other refugees who've been given government evacuation tickets await railroad passage to Liuzhou. About 20,000 civilians jammed the station. Obtaining applications for evacuation tickets was no problem, but the fare of 30,000 Chinese dollars and the lack of rail facilities made train travel prohibitive to many evacuees. Beside occupying every inch of space inside and on top, passengers rode on boards fastened to rods under the cars. Although deprived of its principal Hunan coal supply, the railroad managed to keep steam up with both coal and wood. Guilin is left behind. Ahead is Liuzhou, a three or four days trip that covers only 80 miles. Meanwhile, at the Great Air Strip with its 550 buildings at the base of high craggy limestone hills, the 14th Air Force continues air operations to stall the advancing Japanese army. For this purpose, C-47s have brought in fragmentation bombs. Loading bombers for flights over Zhuanxian and the Hongyang and Lingling areas.
fire strikes against the advancing enemy, American bombers will have to operate from bases farther to the west. Back at the main intersections of the city, Chinese build pillboxes for a last-ditch defense against the more than 40,000 Japs thrusting southwestward to Guilin. Barbed wire entanglements block the approaches to the city from the north. Chinese soldiers take up positions at the outskirts of the city. Chinese engineers mine the areas of the expected Japanese approach. Mines are of Chinese manufacture. A German 30 caliber machine gun covers the mined area. The Jap column is within 45 miles of the city. Evacuating vital equipment by air transport. General Joseph W. Stilwell, after a brief visit to the scene of evacuation where he conferred with General Chenault, local U.S. and Chinese officers. Leaving Guilin, it's evacuation almost complete. Coolies aid in the demolition of the airstrip by planting 1,000 pound bombs along the runways. pounds of bombs were detonated along the runways alone. Demolition work was in charge of Colonel Waldo Kennerson, builder of the great B-29 bases. Holes left by the bombs were 15 to 20 feet deep and about 30 feet in diameter. Air Base on the last night of Allied occupation. Demolition crews placed a drum of gasoline in each of the 550 buildings, then fired incendiary bullets. Presented in the ruins is an investment of 700 million Chinese dollars or 70 million U.S. dollars. Among the buildings burned were 10 barracks, a mess hall, and a dispensary. destroyed by fire were large sections of the city itself. China's scorched earth greeting to the Japanese invaders. A demolished bridge, the largest wooden truss bridge in China. Guilin awaits the enemy, burned, stripped, and unpeopled. Begun late May with the advance on Zhongsha, the Japanese offensive nears its objective. But beyond this area of desolation, the evacuated Allied forces continue to fight on. The Allied campaign to drive the Japs from northern Burma and complete a supply route to China continues despite high waters and waist-deep mud. Heavy monsoon rains washed out this bivouac area at strategically important Kamang in the Mogong Valley. Chinese artillery troops fighting under General Stilwell transport their vehicles to high ground employing a makeshift ferry. Cable, rope, oil drums, and the ponton boat used in this operation are all part of captured Japanese materiel. Despite the floods, by August, Allied forces had overcome last resistance delaying completion of more than 160 miles of the Lido Road, which will be the first southern land link with China since the Japs cut the Burma Road. Mogan was attacked repeatedly before falling to the Allies. A railway bridge bombed by American aircraft while still in Japanese hands is speedily repaired. Sikhs of an Indian engineer's company handle the assignment.
On the nearby mogong Michinaw Railroad line, also captured by the Allies, a brand new use is found for the Jeep. It pulls six light two-wheeled cars. By employing two Jeeps placed back to back, one at each end of the train, trips can be made without switching. Personnel and supplies flown into a captured airstrip at Michinaw are transported along the 30-mile spur to Mogong, which has no airfield. Thus, Allied troops are provisioned for twin drives now threatening to crush the remaining Japs in northern Burma. Men of a British brigade en route to Mogong pass knocked out enemy field pieces. Today, an all-British division is operating in Burma, the first such unit to join the variety of contingents serving under General Stilwell. Flat cars make hour-by-hour -hour circuits of the rail line. The tracks have been serviced by repair gangs of an American engineer's light ponton company. They also act as drivers for the trains. These troops participated in the fighting to expel the Japs from last strongholds at Michinaw. In a suicidal stand, the enemy held out against the Allies for 78 days before their organized resistance ended 3rd August. Even before final capture of Michinaw, Allied planes were able to use its important airstrip. P-40Ns conducted up to 44 sorties a day to help neutralize Jap pillboxes and bunkers that prolonged the siege in this area. were attacked within 100 yards of our forward elements. Had bombed enemy at 20 yards from American positions. Japs brought a huge amount of abandoned equipment into Allied hands. A large part of it is put back to use by American Ordnance and Signal Corps men. During three months ending 1st August, five Jap divisions comprising more than half the enemy's total in Burma were destroyed by General Stilwell's forces. This is part of the equipment left behind in the Kameng area. The Jap motor pool includes a 1941 Chevrolet. Also at Kamang, Chindits were evacuated from the jungle after months of active duty. Composed of specially trained Britishers, West Africans and Indian troops, they originally landed in Burma from U.S. gliders and planes early in 1944. Their job was to harass Jap communications, to hold roadblocks and river strong points. hospital unit cares for sick and wounded chindits. Clothes are issued before moving to rest camps. On the way.
way to Kamang after several days in camp. The achievements of the Chindits include a total of enemy dead running into thousands. Before withdrawing from a single roadblock southwest of Mogong, they killed more than 700 Japs. At Sin Kai, Chinese troops demonstrate the results of training according to U.S. Army doctrine and under American instructors. ready for field assignments. At the present time, their countrymen are locked in fierce battles with the Japs near the Burma border in an attempt to join other Allied columns pushing down the Lido Road. Chinese troops form an integral part of General Stilwell's army, whose gains have been the most important made by the Allies on the Asiatic continent. At Colombo, Ceylon, 31st July, General Stilwell arrives on his first extended trip away from the jungle fighting since last December, when he attended the Cairo conference. He's met by Brigadier General Frank Merrill. Ceylon, 10th August, following confirmation of General Stilwell's promotion to a full general. And the conduct of the war against Japan was complicated by quite different problems. China Burma and India comprised one of the forgotten areas of the war. The war with Japan was not limited to the battles on Pacific Islands. On the Asiatic mainland, the struggle against the warriors of Imperial Japan was fought on some of the most difficult terrain in the world. First to oppose Nipponese aggression, China's Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek battled the invaders for 10 years before Pearl Harbor. Fighting on China's side were three squadrons of some 250 volunteer American airmen who called themselves the Flying Tigers, commanded by Texas-born Colonel Claire Chenault. In those dark days before Pearl Harbor, a handful of Americans took an active part in the attempt to check the Japanese aggressor. In the late 1930s, Japan extended its area of control on the Asian continent. To the south, the Emperor's troops concentrated their attacks on China's coastal cities. With the area bordering the sea conquered, Japanese troops sealed off China's armies in the interior most effectively. But Japan was well aware that China was not thoroughly blockaded as long as supplies from the outside world could be brought into Rangoon, thence transported by rail to northern Burma, finally across the mountains to China via the Burma Road. In July 1940, that supply line too was sealed off. In Tokyo, the British ambassador, Sir Robert Craigie, advised Japanese Foreign Minister Arita that Great Britain was closing the Burma Road, a move intended to appease Japan while Britain was engaged in a life-or-death struggle in Europe and Africa. The vital lifeline to China was cut for three months. In October, the road was reopened by the British, 
whose policy in Asia was stiffening, and supplies were again unloaded in Burma for the long overland journey to central China. On that tortuous route depended China's hope for survival in the desperate struggle against the aggressors. By December 7, 1941, the Japanese had succeeded in winning control of great areas of the Asian continent. On December 8, Japanese troops in Asia went to work in earnest. One of their main objectives was Burma. Japanese troops quickly took possession of Lower Burma, where the British oil wells were located. Before pulling out, British forces had set fire to the oil fields, which fell into Japanese hands in mid-April 1942. The conquerors embarked at once on a program of winning over the Burmese to their own point of view. Speaking in Burmese, Japanese officers expounded the doctrine of Asia for the Asiatics. The natives in the areas already controlled by the Japanese were skeptical but curious. In the hills where Britain's Indian troops were in hiding, the Japanese were forced to go to a little more trouble to get their message across. Their propaganda was artfully introduced by authentic Indian music. The invaders weren't relying wholly on propaganda to achieve their objectives. The Burma Road was one of their most important targets in those early months of 1942. On the ground, the Japanese were intent on driving north from their newly conquered territory to cut the Burma Road and completely isolate China. That ambitious plan called for Japanese troops to advance more than 500 miles over difficult terrain against an Allied delaying action. The Emperor's troops attacked with great determination. In late March, the invaders had seized Tonggu, routing Chinese forces commanded by U.S. General Vinegar Joe Stilwell. Thoroughly overpowered, the Allied forces retreated, followed closely by the Japanese, and finally reached Imphal in India, just as the monsoon season began. Thus ended one of the most remarkable retreats in military history. Quantities of American munitions and equipment were seized by the enemy during the chase. In their conquest of Burma, the Japanese took a considerable number of British prisoners of war. British resistance in all of Southeast Asia was ended by May 1942. Throughout Asia, British prestige had dropped to a new low. With the Burma lifeline cut, a new route to China was devised, by way of India, thence by air across the towering Himalayas to beleaguered central China. Into Calcutta Harbor came thousands of tons of supplies for China's troops, who were still grimly battling the enemy in the interminable struggle. Plus the invaluable vehicles so necessary in mobile 20th century warfare. At airfields in India's province of Assam, great quantities of American material were loaded aboard transport planes for the most difficult leg of the trip. The flight across the Himalayas came to be known in the CBI as flying the hump. Crossing the top of the world was a stirring experience for the airmen assigned to the run. The trip never became routine. The hump had to be cleared at more than 18,000 feet, and there were no possible spots for emergency landings below. Across the formidable mountains lay the plains of China. The airfield at Kunming was the eastern terminus of the hump run. The Chinese gratefully welcomed the weapons and supplies which would enable them to continue the long, desperate struggle against the invaders. 
But getting that equipment to the Chinese troops was far from an easy job. Transportation in the interior of China was still a primitive operation. The last leg of the trip was achieved by the most ancient methods at a painfully slow rate of progress. Chang's forces continued to fall back under the weight of fresh enemy attacks. The Chinese situation from a military standpoint was growing steadily worse. And with every Chinese defeat, thousands of civilian Chinese straggled back from the area seized by the enemy. Headquarters of the Chinese government had been moved to Chongqing as long ago as November 1937. Here, more than a thousand miles inland, Free China dug in, determined to fight the enemy to the last. Air raid shelters were built out of the solid rock. The inhabitants of Chongqing grew accustomed to sudden raids by enemy planes. China's new capital was a high priority target for Japanese bombers. As soon as the enemy planes were spotted far out of town, the alarm would be turned in without a moment's delay. Chongqing was bombed with increasing frequency as the enemy gained ground in China. For the Chinese, 1943 was a most critical year in the long war against the Nipponese invaders. Chongqing was also a nerve center for the Chinese communists, who early in the war had agreed to cooperate with the nationalists in the fight against the common enemy. But in practice, the communists rarely cooperated with the Chinese nationalists. Throughout World War II, the nationalists were forced to cope with two enemies. The plight of the Chinese nationalist forces and the Chinese government grew more desperate. Politically as well as militarily, Free China was being backed into a corner. At the Quadrant Conference of Allied Powers in Quebec, the critical problems of Eastern and Southeastern Asia were explored in some detail. It was felt that the confusion of allied commands in that theater was contributing to the enemy's successes. To help simplify the tangled situation, the Southeast Asia Command was created to be headed by Admiral Lord Louis Montbatten. The new commander took over his post with a great feeling of optimism. I feel very honored to have been appointed to the Southeast Asia Command. As you know, it is an Allied command, and I'm particularly proud to think that there will be United States forces and British forces fighting side by side in the Southeast Asia Command with our Chinese allies until we've finally thrown the Japs out and final victory is won. China's Generalissimo, unfortunately, did not agree on the conduct of the war with Lord Mountbatten, nor with his deputy, U.S. General Joe Stilwell. But on lower levels, the mixture of allied forces worked more smoothly. Chinese troops were instructed in the techniques of modern warfare by American soldiers. The Chinese were quick to respond to the American training. From airfields in Chinese territory, U.S. planes of the 14th Air Force flew countless missions against the enemy, which was pressing the attack against the Chinese. The steady, day-by-day -day operations of the 14th Air Force against the enemy in China helped materially to keep free China in the battle during those dark years. In Burma in late 1943, Allied troops were set to embark on the road back to eventual final victory. In late December, at a small clearing in northern Burma, General Vinegar Joe Stilwell returned to lead the forces back to the territory from which he had retreated a year and a half earlier. 
In this drive, Stilwell had under his command two American-trained Chinese divisions, the 22nd and the 38th. The campaign to take Michina was waged by a force of men fighting against overpowering odds. The chief of staff of the U.S. Army at the time, General George Marshall, summed it up in his war reports. The mission that the Joint Chiefs of Staff had given General Stilwell in Asia was one of the most difficult of the war. He was out at the end of the thinnest supply line of all. He could have only what was left. He had a most difficult physical problem of great distances, almost impassable terrain, widespread disease, and unfavorable climate. He faced an extremely difficult political problem, and his purely military problem of opposing large numbers of enemy with few resources was unmatched in any theater. In his drive back, General Stilwell was accompanied by another celebrated figure, one of the small force of men who had made the memorable retreat, Dr. Gordon Seagrave, the famed Burma surgeon. During 1943, work was rushed on an overland route from India to a junction with the Burma Road. This ambitious construction project was a corollary of Stilwell's Burma campaign. When completed, the Lido Road would give the Allies a valuable supply artery between India and Burma. The road builders followed closely behind the fighting men. In the construction of the road, American ingenuity was supplemented by time-tested Asian methods. The results were gratifying to everyone connected with the project. But all this effort on the part of more than 20,000 engineers and laborers was to prove eminently worthwhile. For the flow of desperately needed supplies for the Chinese troops could be increased. The enemy still held much of the area through which the road would pass. From Lido in India, the route would wind across the rugged terrain to Michina in northern Burma, and then to a junction with the Burma Road thus effecting a continuous highway from India to China. Behind the enemy's lines, U.S. General Frank Merrill and a band of 3,000 officers and men who called themselves Merrill's Marauders played a leading role in the fight to gain control of Michina Airfield. Since the Marauders were usually isolated, they were supplied by airdrops of food and munitions. This system of supply on which the success of the marauders depended demanded a close liaison between air crews and the raiders. In their perilous operations, Merrill's men suffered heavy casualties. Using the same tactics employed to good advantage in Burma a year earlier by Wingate's raiders, the marauders fought five major and 30 minor engagements against a stronger enemy force and achieved their objective. Gliders were employed to ferry some of the fighting engineers to Michener Airfield. To many veterans of the theater, the struggle for Michener Airfield signified the turning of the tide in Burma. The engineers arrived at Michener Airfield soon after it passed into Allied hands in mid-May 1944. In fact, the airfield had just been seized from the enemy when work was begun on repairing the strip. The only all-weather strip in northern Burma, Michener Airfield was vital to the success of the Allied campaign in that country. On the day after the strip was captured, General Stilwell arrived to pay his respects to General Merrill, whose marauders had succeeded in their difficult assignment. From Michener Airfield, bombing runs could be undertaken against enemy forces in the fight for the territory surrounding the town of Michener. On the ground, forward observers called for more air support.
Just as important as the pressing military needs in the CBI were the diplomatic considerations. In an effort to keep peace among the Allied forces in the Orient, the U.S. sent several emissaries to Chongqing, among them Vice President Henry Wallace. Mr. Wallace recommended to Washington that China be separated from the command of Zhang's bitter opponent, U.S. General Stilwell, a proposal seconded by the Generalissimo. But U.S. policy in China in 1944 was as variable as the spring breezes which played among the reeds. China's Generalissimo was often toasted one day and scorned the next. In the late summer and early fall of that year, the Chinese were forced to fall back again. Guilin and other cities in southeastern China were abandoned to the enemy. The hapless Chinese were the victims of a determined enemy offensive. Only in China was the Allied position so weak that the enemy could still seize territory in considerable quantity. At Guilin and at Liuzhou, the U.S. 14th Air Force bases were in danger of being overrun and had to be abandoned. Before the American airmen pulled out, they took great pains to be certain that the enemy would not get much use out of the installations in the field. Bombs were set at strategic points on the airstrips. The major air bases at Guilin and Liuzhou were evacuated in the autumn of 1944. The enemy gained possession of an area which included a total of eight forward U.S. air bases, but not in very usable condition. All over the world, the Allies were driving the enemy back, but in China, the Allied position was steadily deteriorating. In Chongqing, U.S. General Albert Wedemeyer replaced recently recalled General Stilwell as Zhang's chief of staff. In late 1944, the Allied military picture grew somewhat brighter. In China and India, the finishing touches were added to air bases which accommodated America's newest and largest bombers. From these bases, it was confidently felt, the enemy's offensives could be effectively dispersed by America's newest air weapon. The new B-29s, operating in the CBI as the 20th Air Force, were capable of covering a range of targets which stretched from Rangoon to Japan itself. In the reconquest of Burma, the super fortresses were used in softening up the enemy's hold on the country's capital and chief port, Rangoon. In one raid on Rangoon, 56 B-29s participated. To the north, Mandalay was under attack by Allied planes and British ground forces for more than two months. Southeast Asia commander Lord Mountbatten inspected Mandalay soon after its capture by British forces. Meanwhile, in Lower Burma, between Mandalay and Rangoon, American bombers attacked enemy military targets for the first time with Azon bombs, directed to their pinpointed objectives by radio control. The results were most successful. The capture of Rangoon was speeded up by an invasion from the air. A force of Gurkha paratroopers jumped in an assault on a strong point which dominated the approach to Rangoon. The operation went off smoothly, but it developed that the air invasion had not been necessary after all. British ground forces entering Rangoon via landings along the coast 
found that the enemy had abandoned the city. 38 months after Rangoon had been forfeited to the aggressors, Burma's capital was once again in British hands. The reconquest of Burma had required the services of more than a million men. But final victory always made the long, bitter campaign seem worthwhile. In the retaking of Burma, a considerable number of British prisoners were liberated. Some had been taken captive by the enemy three years before, but throughout their long internment, they never gave up hope. In early 1945, the first truck convoy left from Lido, India, bound for China via the Lido and Burma roads, now linked. This invaluable artery across the rugged mountains helped materially to speed up the flow of supplies to China. But even in full operation, the overland route, christened the Stillwell Road, accounted for only a third as much tonnage as was flown across the hump in the waning months of the war. To facilitate the flow of fuel from India to northern Burma and China, several pipelines were constructed. From India, the fuel was pumped via pipe as far as Kunming, more than 900 miles away. Thus, one more lifeline was established with beleaguered China. In early 1945, the Chinese mounted an offensive and succeeded in forcing the enemy back somewhat in certain areas. But though the Chinese scored limited gains, the Japanese were by no means in retreat throughout China. By the closing months of World War II, the Chinese gained some ground, but also lost much valuable territory. Zhang's forces continued to attack, but even the most optimistic of his allies never felt that the Chinese could win back China. The blueprint for war in the Far East, called by history the Tanaka Memorial, was drawn in 1927. It proclaimed that Japan must adopt the policy of blood and iron. In order to conquer the world, Japan must conquer Europe and Asia. In order to conquer Europe and Asia, Japan must first conquer China. Ten years later, in 1937, Japan begins to execute the plan. city, province by province, the Japanese slash in the vast, unyielding body of China. China bleeds from a thousand wounds, but her 500 million people will not be subdued. China's leaders have neither planes, nor tanks, nor artillery, nor organized armies with which to stem the flood of one million Japanese soldiers. But with what little she has, China fights on under her leader, Chiang Kai-shek. Land is the one forbidding weapon China does have. Blast, burn, destroy everything on land, everything in the invader's path. Surrender only the scorched earth. Japan cuts 300,000 square miles out of the heart of Republican China. And China's coast is shackled to Japan's navy. A million refugees flee inland. The incident in China today will be war in the world tomorrow.
and deeper into the interior, beyond the reach of the invaders. A mass migration toward the new capital of free China, toward Chongqing, landlocked oasis in the midst of Asia. China's sole access to survival now lies southward across the Himalayas, southward to Burma. Rangoon, Mandalay, Lashio are joined together by rail and road. From the port of Rangoon, supplies are carried north. To link China with Burma, a road is built from Chongqing to Lashio, the Burma Road. On this road hangs China's only hope of health, of life. The independent kingdom of Siam is Burma's eastern roommate, Siam. Land of teak and mangrove. Land of 16,000 temples. To reach Burma, to cut the Burma road, to isolate China completely, the Japanese must first absorb Siam. it they do, without violence or resistance. Siam, already betrothed to Japan, succumbs gracefully the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese get their base for the invasion of Burma. Semi-Oriental ceremonies legalize the Union. after Pearl Harbor, the Imperial Japanese Army bursts across the border of Siam into Burma. Five months of ravaging and slaughter lie ahead before the Allied defenders are split and shattered. Into central Burma go the invaders on the road to Mandalay. Mandalay, whose conquest will cut the Burma road. In May of 1942, the city falls. China is isolated. China is cut off from her allies. Now it is the British and Burmese who put their wealth and resources to the torch. These the enemy shall not have. The flames that were lit in China now scorch the earth that is Burma. The Allies are driven out of Burma. But the Japanese have been deafened by the sound of their own guns. For the wind is in the palm trees, and the temple bells they say, Come you back, you British soldier. Come you back to Mandalay. In Canada, in Quebec, Allied statesmen and the combined chiefs of staff plan their return to Mandalay, to Chongqing. China, Burma, India have moved to the forefront of global planning. China must be kept in the war. Land communications must be reopened. A supreme commander is chosen to direct the campaign in Southeast Asia. Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten. From the island of Ceylon, from bases in India, Lord Mountbatten marshals his sea power without which no land campaign will be possible. The United States carrier Saratoga is welcomed to the Allied East Indies fleet by the crew of the British battleship Queen Elizabeth. The Royal Navy, the United States Navy, and the navies of France, the Netherlands, Australia, South Africa, pool their warships to guard seven million square miles of ocean. The mission of the fleet in these waters is threefold. Deny the Indian Ocean and adjacent waters to the enemy. Cut his communications with Burma. Protect the Allied convoys, on whose safe arrival the destiny of Southeast Asia now depends. His Majesty's Indian ship. India is a focal point in the world's communication system, and Indians have been seafarers since prehistoric times. 
In World War II, Indian ships and sailors fight in the Battle of the Atlantic, in North Africa, at Sicily. And as the Royal Indian Navy, they help defend their homeland against Japanese invasion, keep the sea lanes open to liberate Burma, to save China. Cruisers like His Majesty's ship Delhi, destroyers like the Rajput, patrol the Bay of Bengal, the Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Manar, alert, efficient, ready to fight for the cause of freedom. Japanese prowl the Indian Ocean, an ever-constant threat to Allied convoys carrying men and supplies to China, Burma, India. The main body of the Japanese surface fleet has more than it can do to cope with the United States Navy in the Pacific. But there are Imperial submarines to spare. vast oceans, past three great continents, the supplies for victory reach the docks of Calcutta, from the United States, from Great Britain, from the factories of India herself. Half a world away, the war in Europe demands and consumes millions of men, billions of supplies. Half a world away, the war in the Pacific demands and consumes more millions of men, more billions of supplies. Calcutta gets only what can be spared from democracy's ever-emptying arsenals. planes will fly a portion of the supplies into China over the Himalayan hump at the rate of 47,000 tons a month. Even so, the overwhelming mass of materiel must reach China overland, or China will perish. The problem of getting the supplies through becomes the toughest of the war, of any war in history. The first link is a ramshackle railroad that hauls the supplies north from Calcutta. The first link is the easy link. East Asia overrun by the Japanese, with the Burma Road cut. Allied supplies pour from Calcutta to Lido, on the border of India. 
from Lido, the Allies must now hack a road out of the central Burmese jungle, fighting the enemy and nature all the way to join up with the old Burma road. Troops, supplies, equipment assembled to drive the Japanese from Burma, to build a road, and to lay a pipeline along the route to carry desperately needed oil and gasoline to China. But before engineers can build, armies must fight. And before armies can fight, man must wait on weather. The monsoon that storms in from the Indian Ocean at every change of season. Lashing jungle and mountain with war, paralyzing torrents of rain. has come. A truly cosmopolitan army stands ready for the bitter ordeal ahead in Burma. Scotsmen, Irishmen, Welshmen, Americans, Australians, New Zealanders, Indians, Gurkhas, Burmese, Africans, Chinese, British. The campaign begins late in 1943. Into the jungle file the Allied troops. Into the jungle that reeks and steams with a thousand fetid evils spread by germ and insect. Malaria, cholera, typhus, dysentery, beriberi, tropical fever. It will be a war of hunting and stalking, of ambush and infiltration, of sudden alarm by day, of strange terrors by night. Behind the combat troops come the engineers to lay their pipeline foot by foot, yard by yard, across the conquered jungle. And foot by foot, yard by yard, the road begins to creep across the conquered jungle. of the Irrawaddy, boat yards, and then boats are hewn out of the forest. Amphibious craft for the next assault, the next landing. The interior of Burma is slashed and crisscrossed by wide, tumultuous rivers almost impassable to man. But not to the men who have determined to conquer nature while conquering the Japanese.
yard by yard, and then mile by mile. The men, the pipe, the road move forward, forward toward China. Japanese units, conquerors of Singapore and Malaya, are decimated in the jungles of Burma. And the vultures, they never had it so good. challenged and beaten in jungle warfare. Churchill never made a truer statement. In spite of untold hardships and frustration, in spite of the hazards of nature and the enemy, the men who made up the Allied forces in Southeast Asia meet the challenge and overcome the obstacle. back, you British soldier. Come you back to Mandalay. And back they come, the British 14th Army. Meanwhile, through jungle, swamp, and forest, over ridge, hill, and mountain, across river and ravine, 2,000 miles of pipeline, an enormous artery pumping a life-giving transfusion of gasoline and oil into China. becomes one of the greatest feats of construction in man's ancient endeavor to move from one place to another. The Japanese are cleared from central Burma. Now from Lido stretch highway and pipeline south and east across Burma to Lashio into China. The Lido Road, joined at last with the Burma Road, is over.
January 1945, the first convoys head for China, bearing relief for a free country from the free world. The supplies the ships brought in from assembly lines thousands of miles away roll an endless procession toward China. Justice to me, no. Well, well, well. Swimming at sundown and naked all over. Ah, just my meat. It's Snafu. I never forget a face. Hmm. No resistance. Hmm. Now, where did that little son of a gun go? <laughs> Caught me with his pants up. But I'll show the little... for the soft underbelly of Snafu. Oh, <laughs> 